Japan is home to a style of tattoos that is held in high regard among tattoo aficionados all over the world. Much like Japan itself, the history of their tattoo culture is just as old as it is complicated and fascinating. It actually goes back not tens or hundreds, but thousands of years. But despite this long relationship with tattoos, this art form is now in a complicated spot in Japan. For the vast majority of Japanese citizens, ink beneath the skin is synonymous with the country's organized crime groups, the Yakuza. To understand how it came to this, we will need to look at the history of Japanese tattoos from the very beginning. Not only because it's necessary, but because it's simply a fascinating topic to explore. This video is divided into six chapters. In chapter one, we will explore the beginning of tattoo culture in Japan in prehistoric times. Chapter two will explain how tattoos were used as a punishment for the first time. Chapter three covers the development of tattoo designs and culture during the Edo period and the subsequent influence of a certain Chinese novel in chapter four. Chapter 5 takes us from the Meiji era into modern times and to close things out, Chapter 6 tells the story of how Japanese crime groups and tattoos are connected. This is the history of Japanese tattoo culture. Our search for the earliest example of tattoos in general will take us to the Ötztal Alps, close to the border between Austria and Italy. Here, a frozen body was found by two German hikers, which was discovered to be between 5,200 and 5,300 years old. On this frozen body, which received the name Ötzi, a simple form of tattoos was also discovered. Other examples of tattoos from thousands of years ago are provided by Egyptian mummies from around 2000 BC. These tattoos though actually took on some more sophisticated shapes than what was found on Ötzi. Where and by whom tattoos were invented is pretty much an unsolvable mystery. After all, bodies tend to decompose very quickly, unless they are frozen or mummified, like the two examples I mentioned before. It's safe to assume that the technique behind tattooing was discovered by many different cultures around the globe independently, by accident. As for Japan, its earliest discovery of what resembles a tattoo might come in the shape of ceramic figures from the so-called Chomon era of prehistoric Japan, which covers the time period from 14,000 up to 300 BC. The Chomon people developed into a quite sophisticated society and even produced art, including these ceramic figures, also known as Dogu. The oldest of these, the Kasaka figurine, dates back to around 5000 BC and shows what appeared to be face tattoos in the shape of simple lines and dots. These are believed to be tattoos, not face paint, for one particular reason. If the artists wanted to imitate the look of face paint, the lines and dots would most likely have been painted onto the figurine. The actual use of carving techniques led researchers to the belief that these were indeed representations of simple tattoos, also because of their similarity to the tattoos of the Maori people in New Zealand. The Chomon period of Japan was followed by the so-called Yayoi period, named after the Yayoi people who came from the Korean peninsula onto the islands of Japan. Now, these islands were inhabited by two very different cultures, the Chomon, who developed their own culture on the Japanese islands over thousands of years, and the Yayoi, which brought in culture from mainland Asia, which was much more advanced in many ways. This period of Japanese history also has much more convincing evidence of the existence of tattoo culture. For one, ceramic figures similar to those from the Chomon era were discovered but they were also accompanied by two historical texts from China, which contained information about Yayoi period Japan. The first text, known as Wei Qi, is about a kingdom by the name of Wei, located in the northeast of modern-day China. In one chapter of this text, there is a mention of 
Eastern Barbarians, which also included the so-called Wa people. The Wa are actually what we now call the Japanese. The text states the following. As for the men, whether high or low, they all tattoo their bodies. The Wa, who are familiar with swimming and who are skilled in diving down into the waters in order to catch fish and clams, tattooed their bodies as a means to drive away large fish and waterfowl. After a while, the tattooing became merely ornamental. The body tattooing of the various countries differ from each other, some being applied on the left side, some on the right side. Some are large, some are small. The difference is based on the distinctions of social class. This tells us that the tattoos of the Wa people, the Japanese, were used for spiritual purposes at first. Later though, tattoos were used as a means of differentiating between different social classes and places of origin. The second of two texts describing Yayoi period Japan is called Hohan Shu and had the Han period of China from around 25 to 250 AD as its central topic. However, the text was written in 445 AD, which means that its accuracy has to be taken with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, most descriptions from the first text are repeated and confirmed here. One interesting additional detail here is that apparently, not only Japanese men, but also women had these tattoos. Over the course of the next few centuries, the Chomon people were pushed further and further north by the Yayoi people. Eventually, they continued to reside north of today's Kanto region, where modern-day Tokyo is located. They did so until around the 9th century AD, which is also the time period from which we receive a definite mention of Chomon tattoo culture. The Nihon Shoki, or Chronicles of Japan, was written around 720 AD and gives us a lot of detailed descriptions of ancient Japan. In it, the Chomon are also mentioned under the name Emishi. Takenoichi no Sukune returned from the East Country and informed the Emperor, saying in the Eastern Wilds there is a land called Hitakami. The people of this country, both men and women, tie up their hair in the form of a mallet and tattoo their bodies. They are of fierce temper and their general name is Emishi. Moreover, their land is wide and fertile. We should attack them and take it. It is important to note that these tattoos by the Chomon mentioned here were most likely a lot different than those found on the ceramic figurines. The Chomon people described here are from the years between 300 to 600 AD, at which point the figurines were several thousands of years old. Also, with the arrival of the Yayoi people hundreds of years earlier, there is no doubt that the two cultures influenced each other in many ways, including tattoo designs. Nevertheless, this is some fascinating information. The time period described in these chronicles is called the Kohun era. At this time, tattoos in general would take on a whole new meaning altogether. For the first time in Japanese history, tattoos would be connected to criminals. The Nihon Shoki, the Chronicles of Japan, give us some insight on the use of tattoos as punishment for criminal acts from the 5th century. The first case talks about Emperor Ritsu, who apparently had a death sentence for treason converted into a different kind of punishment, which saw the perpetrator receive a tattoo next to his eye, serving as the permanent mark of a criminal. Case number two revolves around yet another emperor and his beloved bird, which was unfortunately eaten by the dog of some guy. Again, the owner of the dog was punished with a face tattoo. At the time, a Japanese state by the name of Yamato started bringing in more and more cultural influences from China. With this kind of punishment also being used in Han Dynasty China, we can assume that it was part of these cultural imports. Due to the marking of criminals with ink beneath the skin for many years, Tattoos were generally seen as a barbaric thing for the Chinese, reserved for inferior citizens and cultures. Japan, as mentioned before, was hugely influenced by China as time went on. Due to this, they sort of tried to appeal to their neighbor from the mainland, which resulted in the untimely death of tattoo culture for decorative purposes in Japan. Understandably, citizens did not want to be put into the same category as those who committed criminal acts, which strangely reflects the Japan of today, but we'll get to that later. 
However, one thing is very important to remember here. Japan at the time was not a unified country. It was actually quite fragmented. Due to this fragmentation of the islands, surely many residents of what we now call Japan must have continued with tattoo practices in one form or another. The Chomon, who were heavily discriminated against, as is, might have been an example of this. Jumping forward a few hundred years, there are interesting records about Buddhist priests in Japan who had tattoos on their bodies, which resembled symbols and figures from the Buddhist religion. This might have been the first time in Japanese history that people got tattoos voluntarily and not in connection to a certain group, social class or as punishment. However, this happened incredibly rarely and did not in any way lead to a big shift in Japanese tattoo culture, which would be pretty much at a standstill until the start of the Edo period in 1604. In 1604, after centuries of wars ravaging the Japanese islands, its countless clan-occupied areas would finally merge into one nation, which we now know as Japan. The population of big cities like Edo, which is now Tokyo, Kyoto and Osaka grew at a rapid pace. Its citizens, also known as Chonin, were able to afford entertainment in the form of kabuki theater performances and books for the first time ever. An increasing number of these books featured incredibly detailed illustrations, which were put into mass production thanks to a technique called woodblock printing. These illustrations themselves went by the name ukiyo-e, or Pictures of the Floating World, and gained massive popularity. Just imagine how exciting it must have been at the time to be able to afford a piece of art as a common citizen. Ukiyo-e usually depicted scenes from everyday life of the chonin, but they also featured portraits of some famous kabuki actors from time to time. In a way, these could be considered the first fan posters in history. The government saw the rise of these forms of entertainment and got more than a bit worried, with art presenting an easy way of expressing criticism against one's government. Consequently, the leaders of Japan tried to censor art in the big cities, which ultimately failed. Many artists at the time were not afraid to face the consequences of producing provocative forms of art and entertainment. For those who were found guilty of certain crimes though, an old familiar punishment made its return. The tattoo. These tattoos now carried the name Irezumi, which means inserting ink, and were meant to punish illegal activities like theft, blackmail or fraud. Occasionally, the tattoos were also combined with an exile from the area that the crime was committed in. The tattoos themselves had very simple designs to make them both easier to produce and identify. Speaking of identification, these simple designs brought some helpful information with them. For example, the design told onlookers exactly which area the perpetrator's crime was committed in. Sometimes, the amount of crimes accumulated was also included in these designs. To give a few examples, a crime in Osaka would see you receive a tattoo consisting of two black parallel bars above your right elbow. In Edo, which is now known as Tokyo, the same design was used, but on the upper part of the left forearm instead. Every area had its own design, which also made enforcing the aforementioned exiles much, much easier. A few of these tattoos even ended up on the forehead of the criminal and could also come in the shape of a letter. For example, the kanji, which are Chinese letters used in the Japanese language, for bad or evil was a popular choice. An especially creative version of Irezumi started off with one horizontal line on the forehead, symbolizing one crime. As the crimes kept piling up, criminals could receive up to three additional lines on their forehead. When completed, the tattoo now represented the kanji for inu, which means dog. I think that's as funny as punishment tattoos can get. The inking of tattoos in this era was done by a social class by the name of Hinin or non-humans, which mostly had a criminal past themselves. They did this with a special tool made of bamboo sticks with a bunch of needles attached to the front. With it, they penetrated the skin and pushed the ink inside, creating a tattoo. As for the recipients of such tattoos, they were now marked for life, making reintegration into society an impossibility. 
For some criminals who were disgusted with society anyways, the tattoos might actually have been worn with a certain sense of pride, though. Those who would have liked to get back to everyday life attempted to get rid of the tattoo somehow, either by cutting it out or by simply tattooing over it. However, due to the sheer size of these tattoo designs, it was hard to find a design that could properly cover it. One popular option for this was the silhouette of a bat, or sometimes even figures from Buddhism, with the aforementioned ukiyo-e woodblock prints providing a great source for such imagery. One interesting thing to consider is that in order to return to society by tattooing over the irizumi, non-criminal citizens must already have been in possession of such tattoos. Otherwise, having a tattoo of a bat or a Buddhist figure would make you stand out anyways, which implies that at the time, there appears to have been a group of people who got tattoos voluntarily and for purely aesthetic purposes. Further evidence for this is presented in a report from the late 17th century, which mentions a man from Asakusa who proudly wore a tattoo consisting of several large Buddhist-related letters spread across his back. Just like today, Lovers in Edo period Japan also started getting tattoos related to their significant other, which they might or might not have regretted later on in life. The most popular design for such a lover's tattoo consisted of the lover's name, accompanied by the kanji for inochi, or life. A tattoo, much like today, was supposed to show commitment by both suffering through the pain of receiving such a tattoo while also marking oneself for life with the name of the partner. If that wasn't enough to convince your boyfriend or girlfriend, you could also make the final stroke of the kanji longer. This symbolized the longevity of the relationship and also hurt quite a bit more than usual. Less romantic, but way way cooler, were reports of people in the mid-18th century getting tattoos of things like dragons, severed heads, plants or animals. This might be exactly what the criminals tried to imitate after receiving their punishment tattoos. The Edo period also saw the rise of the machiako, or the servants of the town, who protected citizens against violent, unemployed samurai who would attack innocent people from time to time. These machiako groups are considered to be the precursor of what we now call the Yakuza. Some of these town servants were known to get tattoos in order to seem more intimidating, which was a nice addition to the fancy, colorful clothing that they were known to wear in order to stand out. Tattoos were on the verge of becoming a popular thing in Japan, and a certain Chinese novel would help to finally push them into the mainstream. In the early 18th century, novels from China started making their way to Japan and became all the rage. It was in the 1720s that a story by the name of Shua Hu Chuan, known in English as Water Margin, was translated into Japanese for the first time ever. In Japanese, the story was known under the name Suikoden and is nowadays often compared to the tales of Robin Hood, which might actually have come out at around the same time. The story featured a total of 108 rebels as its main characters, which the Japanese converted from Chinese rebels to Japanese rebels for their translations. More than ever, the citizens of the big cities felt a sense of connection to the characters in the novels they enjoyed so much, which only increased the fandom surrounding these Suikoden stories even more. What's interesting about Suikoden in relation to tattoo culture is that four of these 108 rebels had you guessed it, tattoos, some of them belonging to the most important characters in the whole story. In 1805, an artist that many of you might be familiar with was tasked with creating illustrations for a new translation of the Suikoden story. The name of this artist was Hokuzai, now known mainly for his work 36 Views of Mount Fuji. In it, you will find a print by the name of the Great Wave of Kanagawa, which might be the most famous work in the history of Japanese art. Hokuzai's illustrations of Suikoden also featured four of the main characters who sported tattoos, among which the character Kyumonryu Shishin might stand out the most, with a total of nine dragons tattooed all over his body. You know, because seven or eight dragons would be kinda lame. Although these illustrations were merely done in black and white, 
the impression that they left on the Japanese public was immense. Fascinated readers would take their illustrated novels to their local ukiyo-e artists, which were at the time the only ones who did such tattoo work on the side, and ask them to ink the design of their favorite main character from the Suikoden story onto their bodies. This wasn't a totally new occurrence either, by the way. In the past, people would do the same thing with the aforementioned portraits of famous kabuki actors. Did Japan actually invent cult-like followings? By the early 1800s, tattoos became so popular in Japan that the government tried to put a ban on them, which proved to be unsuccessful. Just like with the censorship of entertainment and literature, people would gladly take on whatever punishment to rock some badass ink. The designs for these kinds of tattoos took a huge leap forward in 1827, when artist Utagawa Kuniyoshi released a set of five illustrations, creating his own version of the Suikoden characters. In comparison to Hokusai though, he would focus a lot more on giving these character illustrations much more detailed tattoos, while also utilizing colors for his work. One aspect that made his vision of tattoos much more detailed was the inclusion of a dark background beneath the tattoo's main design, like the Nine Dragons mentioned before. In addition, he made the tattoo design wrap around the character's whole body, instead of randomly placing it across the body. Slowly but surely, the trademark look of Japanese tattoos starts to take shape, doesn't it? He was also responsible for introducing some now legendary tattoo designs, including Daichin, the God of Thunder, Fujin, the God of Wind, as well as animals like octopi, lobsters, monkeys, and fish. At this point, the development of the tattoo culture inside Japan seemed unstoppable either way. However, these illustrations by both Hokusai and Utagawa accelerated their development quite a bit. Maybe the Japanese would have never moved beyond simple letters and love tattoos if it wasn't for these two guys. The Edo era came to an end in a spectacular way in 1853, when the American Commodore Perry sailed into Yokohama and told the Japanese to open its borders to the rest of the world. You see, at this point, Japan had been isolated by closing off its borders for 220 years. The Japanese government, now under immense pressure from the West, saw no other choice but to comply with the Americans' request and open up its country. With it, they also laid off their chains of feudalism and entered the so-called Meiji era, named after the Emperor of Japan during this time. From then on, Emperor Meiji completely changed his country, introducing a new democratic government in addition to many other Western ideas, and even their clothing. They did all this out of fear of falling behind the rest of the world and eventually falling apart. Adapting and reinventing Japan was the only option, with so much Western influence making its way into the land of the rising sun, traditional Japanese culture was now seen by the general public as barbaric and primitive in comparison to that of the new American and European friends. This also led to yet another ban of tattoos in Japan, starting in 1872. Again, citizens ignored the rules on this matter and continued to proudly show off the artworks on their skin. This was a thorn in the eye of the Japanese government, who were afraid that their foreign business partners who came to visit would see their country's tattoo culture as something despicable. Overseas visitors at the time definitely had a strong opinion on tattoos, but it was not what the government expected. It had the exact opposite effect. Westerners were incredibly impressed with the detailed work that Japanese tattoo artists were able to produce. Europe in the late 19th century experienced a huge rise in popularity regarding tattoos, but compared to the Japanese style, the European counterpart could only be described as primitive and in some ways uninspired. It must have been an unbelievable sight for curious tourists from all over the world, with Japanese art in general gaining huge amounts of respect across the globe. For example, artists like Monet and Van Gogh, who are considered to be some of the greatest painters in history, were inspired by the ukiyo-e art of Japan. Japanese-style tattoos became so popular, in fact, that even European royals became obsessed with them. In his diary, King George V told a story about how he hired a Japanese tattoo artist by the name of Horicho, 
to ink a tiger and a dragon onto each of his arms. They were supposed to represent the East and the West. Queen Olga of Greece and Tsar Nicholas II, Russia's last emperor, were also customers of that same tattoo artist, among many other European nobles. Despite all of this interest bubbling up from all sides of the spectrum, the ban on tattoos was not lifted and wouldn't be for a very, very long time. 1948, to be exact. By then, Japan had already fought and lost the war against the US and was now occupied by the same nation that defeated them. The American occupation in Japan brought with it many changes and government reforms, lifting some bans along with it, which also included that of tattoos. With inking now legal once again, in combination with the release of photo books, tattoos had a quick resurgence among Japanese citizens. However, this newly found interest in tattoos would soon be transformed into something deeply negative and problematic. The rise of organized crime in Japan after World War II happened at a rapid pace. An unexpected yet logical side effect of this rise was the renewed connection made between criminals and tattoos in Japan. Just like it had been the case twice already in the country's incredibly long history. While tattoos were certainly not a thing that was exclusive to the Yakuza, Japan's organized crime groups, there are a few factors that established a firm connection between the two. But before talking about these connections in particular, we have to understand one thing. Why do so many Yakuza even get a tattoo? The first, very obvious reason is that the precursor to the Yakuza, the Machiyako, were known to get inked in order to intimidate and impress. To this day, Yakuza admire the ancient folk tales of their supposed ancestors. It makes a lot of sense then that a certain interest in imitating these role models exists even in modern gang members. Additionally, getting a tattoo is, for the Yakuza, a way of proving your toughness and manliness. Two characteristics that, surely, we all connect with the member of an organized crime group. However, a Yakuza tattoo also tells a member's story. There might be more meaning behind these artworks than you think. For example, a Yakuza member who overcame a tough situation in life might receive the design of a koi swimming upstream representing exactly this important moment in his life. The koi itself stands for strength and good luck. In fact, every design has its own special meaning associated with it. The dragon represents bravery and wisdom, the tiger displays strength and courage, while the guardian lion is said to have special protective powers in Buddhism. During visits in bathhouses, a popular place to meet up among Yakuza, these tattoo designs would immediately give a first impression of the other person's personality, even without ever having met them before. Of course, the nudity aspect inside a bathhouse was very helpful in making sure that the other person was, indeed, unarmed. A more negative use of the tattoos came from the amount of popularity that they gained among teenagers. Much of Japan's young generation was fascinated with the art of tattooing, and dreamed of one day being able to afford one themselves. However, even for an adult with a steady income, these tattoos are incredibly hard to afford. And the Yakuza knew exactly how to use this to their advantage. They would promise young people that they would pay for the tattoo that they wanted so badly, and that they could work it off by joining their gang. This worked like a charm, with many vulnerable teenagers lured into the ranks of the Yakuza this way. The big problem here is that once you join or get into any kind of agreement with the Yakuza, it's almost impossible to get out of it again. In the decades following the Second World War, the Yakuza gained notoriety along with their newly found wealth and political influence. Starting in the 60s, countless movies were made about the Japanese gangs, which usually depicted them with very elaborate, mostly full body tattoos. These movies ingrained a direct connection between the fearsome Yakuza gangs and tattoo culture into people's minds over time, just like the introduction of the Irezumi punishment did a few centuries earlier. Even today, many public places prevent people with tattoos from entering, the most prominent example being bathhouses. As mentioned before, tattoos are easily visible in such an environment and were a hotspot of gang activity for a long time. 
Understandably, bathhouses did not want to be associated with Yakuza anymore, and placed this harsh ban upon its visitors. A tattoo could cost you something way more important than a visit to your local bathhouse, though. It could easily prevent you from getting a job in Japan, for the same reasons as stated before. Companies and employers simply want to avoid an association with Yakuza groups at any cost. Because of this huge amount of disregard for inked skin, many tattoo fans, including Yakuza themselves, choose a tattoo design that avoids body parts like hands, forearms, neck or feet. Which makes it easier to cover up tattoos by simply wearing the right clothes. This could potentially save you your job, but the bathhouse visit will probably still be off limits. In conclusion, the history of tattoos in Japan is deeply intertwined with that of the country itself. Looking at how they are perceived by the public during certain time periods will also tell you a lot about how the people at the time felt in general. Tattoos divided the Japanese people into social classes, served as a form of punishment or expression of fandom, told a story about a person, or even cost them their job. Their story had a lot of ups and downs, but it is far from over. While they are currently in somewhat of a bad place socially, it's possible that with the recent decline of the Yakuza, future generations of Japanese citizens will once again be able to enjoy tattoos freely, without any sort of judgement and repercussions. After all, tattoos are incredible pieces of art, which is something that should be both celebrated and enjoyed. What was your favorite part of Japanese tattoo history? Would you ever get one done the traditional but painful way? Let me know in the comments and thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.